There'd be a lot of poop in my pants. <laughs> <laughs> Seen a six foot alligator go swing into the air and slam into a tree. These guys are the scientists of the supernatural, lecturers leaving lessons for inquiring laymen. They are applying the scientific method to a world that baffles science. They are the cryptids of the corn. But who else has big black wings and red eyes? Um, Batman. Oh, Mothman. Oh yeah, Mothman. A great white shark was stolen. Oh, someone stole a shark? I got stuff for you you don't even know about. She's a witch. She turned me into a newt. Who knows? Anything could be possible. Anything could be possible. It's really big. Mm-hmm. Abduction vibes. Holy moly. It sounds like you were abducted. And it just stood up. I mean, it just like kept going and going. And she goes, what the... Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Corn Podcast. I am the great and powerful Mr. E, and tonight I'm missing Jay. But don't worry, you're not going to miss him, because I am joined by a truly amazing guest, uh, Mark Muncy. Mark Muncy's a... Uh, we're going to talk about his books, we're going to talk about all of his research, TV show, all kinds of good stuff tonight. Uh, I could say it, but I'm just going to kick it over to you, Mark, because it's your stuff, so it's going to be a lot easier for you to kind of give the spiel <laughs> than me. Yeah, you know, we want the elevator pitch, but you know, a little bit different. So, yeah, hi, gang. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's a big honor. Uh, uh, I am, uh, as he said, the author of the Erie, Florida book series from History Press. Uh, there are three books in that series, Erie, Florida, Freaky Florida, and Creepy Florida. As each one hit the bestseller list, they kept coming back to me and saying, hey, you got more stories? And I went, yeah, sure. Uh, and um I do things a little different. I, I am not a paranormal. Uh, I, I am not a paranormal researcher per se. I like to call myself a paranormal journalist and a folklorist. Uh, I like to. I go with Bigfoot hunting teams I, or skunk ape teams, as we call them down here in Florida. Uh, you know, we. I go with paranormal teams on ghost hunts. I go with UFO hunting teams, uh, but I am there to get their stories as well as the things they see. Uh, my newest book was Erie Appalachia, or Appalachia if you're from above the <laughs> Mason-Dixon line. Uh, and um, and in that, um, I was following the trail of all the mountain monsters, the holler monsters, these little things that have, you know, the Mothmans before they pop and things like that. And uh, so I got to do the main ones, but I also got to do the oddball ones. And this all started because for 20 years, I ran a haunted attraction in St. Petersburg, and I based it all on local folklore and legends of Florida. So instead of having a werewolf jump out at you, we had a skunk ape jump out at you. And, uh, you know, and most people didn't care. They were going through the haunted house. They didn't know that stuff. But I posted it all on our website. And when we finally got shut down uh, after about 20 years, we were a little too popular and a little too big for our britches. Uh, The city shut us down. And uh, that's when I started doing the books. So, uh, so that's, you know, that's, that's me, you know, in a nutshell. So, so way before way, we've only been doing this podcast for like a year and a quarter now. Mm -hmm. Uh, I heard you on Shannon's show, you know, Shannon, you know, into the fray is one of the, you know, the bigger paranormal podcast out in the U S right now. Uh, I never dreamed one day I'd have you on my show. So it's just a biggest honor for me. Just so you know. Oh, man. No, I've been following you guys for a little while, and it's been fun because you guys came out about the tail end of my Erie Appalachia research. So, of course, some of your stuff coincided with that. And uh, so I was able to uh, you know listen in to some episodes as I was wrapping up. So and now the new book, uh, which has been contracted and will be out this fall, uh, is Erie Southeast. So um, we'll have some fun stuff with that. And we'll be revisiting Florida again for a little bit of that. So Awesome. And you are, are you a Florida native? I know you're living down there now, but. I've been here 30 plus years. Uh, my wife uh, is a native and uh, my, she's the talent. She's the illustrator. She brings all these monsters to life. Her name's Carrie Schultz. And, uh, you know, she, I'm just, I just do the words. She does all the, she does all the hard work and making these monsters come to life. And, um, and she's, uh, she's a native though. So she, 
knew some of these stories, but again, this was my passion and she, she, she used to draw the cute stuff and now I make her draw monsters. So <laughs> I believe she did. Uh, you guys have a pinky illustration, right? On one of the books. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's probably her most famous. Yeah. I, that, I love the um, pinky. Yeah. Uh, even, uh, Shannon's, uh, that, Shannon's got that hanging in her office. So, oh really? Which is nice. So, yeah. That's awesome. Pinky's near and dear to my heart. My family lives in orange city. Uh, oh yeah. So we go down the. I I grew up or not grew up. I'm you know I'm an Ohio boy, but we went every time we could get a chance to go down and gar fish the St. Johns River. Uh, that's actually how I I kind of heard about Pinky. I can't even remember how it came to be. It was a bait shop near oh gosh Del Polyon, uh Springs. Okay. Uh, that yeah. bait shop right there. And I was asking about Bigfoot, and the guy's like, ah, I don't know nothing about Bigfoot. But a while back, we had this big pink river monster. I like, well, yeah. let's talk about that. Like that's, but yeah. Yeah. St. John's again. River. Yeah. As you, as you follow, as you follow these beasts in Florida, we can't have nice things cause we got to rename them stupid stuff, you know, cause it's the St. John's river monster in Georgia or, mm-hmm. you know, maybe even Alahatma, you know, their, you know, it's native name. But then once it crosses the river, you know, crosses the state line in Florida, he becomes pinky because he's the color of boiled shrimp. <laughs> so he's an albino <laughs> sea beast. Um, that lives in the St. John's River. It almost sank a steamship in the 1800s. That's why it's most famous for. Um, but it's got a elongated neck, like a Nessie style. Its face was camel-ish, or you know, in some of the descriptions, yeah. and it had either eye stalks or horns, depending on the description. And uh, and it had a big shell on its back. Now, uh, modern day Pokemon players will say that's Lapras. It does. It, uh, but, it uh, sounds very much. Yep, yep. But, uh, and it was seen for hundreds of years. And then one day in the late 80s, its carcass was seen on in Lake Majori at the end of the St. John's River down uh, almost into the Gulf right near Sanford. And uh, everybody saw this big giant pink carcass on the side of the river. And, um, and then the next day it was gone. Like something had grabbed it and dragged it back into the water or something like that. So uh, was yeah. it Pinky? We don't know, but he has not been really reported since. So the amount of alligators in the St. John's River, I don't imagine a carcass yeah. staying around very long. No, uh, no. You know, if it's got any meat on it, it's it's gone. Yeah, you can you can literally walk across Lake Majori during spawning season, and yeah, and you would just walk on the backs of a bunch of alligators. There's so many freaking alligators in the St. John. I love the St. John's though. Uh, we were down in we were down there on the end of the St. John's fishing that year. I can't remember the actual year. It may have been fifteen when that fin whale got stuck in there. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, we were on the yeah, river cause... when the fin whale got stuck. My mom kept seeing uh, what she she thought it was an overturned boat kept popping up and raising down. Yep. He's only in ten foot of freaking water, following yeah. uh, following the ships in. Yeah, and that's what some people say that you know Pinky was is a uh, you know was an albino seal or an albino whale uh that just got stuck in the river you know of course there's all the explanations for it uh but the you know the people who described the encounters were like dead set no it had a you know a serpent head and you know with jowls and you know and the horns it's it's amazing when you read the descriptions and when you when we actually talked to a couple of the last surviving witnesses it was it was pretty cool they were they were they were pretty you know shaken by what they had seen and still describing it to this day so I believe uh, if I ever go back there, that Del Palion, the Del Palion, whatever the one of the springs right there, he said he'd seen it. That ba- the old, but he was. Let's see, that was I was sixteen, so that was over ten years ago, and he mm. was quite elderly then. Nah. so I've yeah, been, that, yeah, it's one of those. Part things. of what I part of what I do, what I do is because I want you know the. Especially with Appalachia, was uh, you know the you know these were stories that have been passed down generation to generation, and uh, and some of the modern generation just doesn't seem to care, and you know and the Mimas and Peepaws are dying out, so these stories are being left unsaid and un- unwritten, and you know they're not being passed along the fireside chats anymore. So we're we're losing a generation of or generations mm-hmm. of uh, stories and and folklore, and you know so that's my new mission is to try to keep these things alive, you know. And also, it's like, yo, know, hey, Uncle Crazy Uncle Joe walking down the street in 1965 said he saw a Bigfoot. Well, did you document that? No, of course, Crazy Uncle Joe. 
But if you write that down on like the Bigfoot Research Organization website or, you know, the BFRO or any of these other reporting sites or let your friendly local podcast or your crazy local author, you know, know about it. And we can put it on our little databases. And then suddenly we see, oh, wait, June of 65, there were seven sightings in this same county. Suddenly crazy Uncle Joe isn't crazy. And there was something there. And, you know, and, and that's why it's please, if you see something, say something, document, yes. document, document. I mean, we we talk about that all the time. That this stuff is lost every day, yep. uh, just because for, for, especially these old timers don't have an outlet to share this without really feeling like they're going to be judged. And they're ta- you know, thirty even twenty years ago, nobody talked about mm-hmm. Bigfoot like we do now. Nobody talked about the UFOs mm-hmm. like we do now. Now it's like we go up to the bar and we talk about it, and we get people to walk up. We're, now me and Jay are known as those guys. Yeah. So it like we'll be we were in a bar in where were we Tennessee, and somebody walked up and told us a UFO story because they knew who we were. Yeah, uh, yeah. That so, my email box, my phone, bo- my phone mail, every yeah, you because know, I have like the least hidden phone number on the internet, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I get I get, but that's what I want. That's how I get my next stories. That's how I get my next calls, and you know, and how I get the next case that I need to research and. Uh, you know, and being on shows like you, like on End of the Fray with Shannon and, you know, so many others, uh, you know, from the shadows. I, I've been on lots. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I try to, uh, you know, um, and, and when you get on the big ones, that's when it's it's crazy. You know, you said uh, my inbox will be full the next day and I'm like, OK, let's go through these and see which ones are useful. Awesome. Uh, but but I read every one. So feel free to send me any you got people. I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to look through them. And uh, I will have all your you contact may, may get, information below. Yeah. So yeah, anybody wants get a to reach out. And, yeah, you'll get a call from me or an email from me saying, hey, yeah, let's talk because I, I want to know more. So it's so for Pinky, did you ever come across the uh, the long necked pinniped angle? I, I yeah, I, I if you know in Erie, Florida, I mentioned the the several other, you know, sightings like the one where it's walking along the bottom of the of the St. John's and its heads out top or or the the great serpent legend uh where it was like as wide as a flower barrel and you know and it was like a just like an anaconda but this would have been long before we had the invasive species down oh, yeah. here um and uh yeah so there there were a bunch of different you know descriptions of it for a long time but when you narrow it down you exclude all those that's when you get a pretty solid oh pinky had the the neck the head the shell and all that and that you know so that's why he's near and dear to my heart so he's uh I think the others are just other things that people have seen that they didn't understand as well. And that's the other thing with these. I don't like to call them. I don't like cryptids. I don't like ghosts. I don't like, you know, UFOs. I like calling these things we don't understand. Uh, I hate supernatural. That's like my least favorite word. I like to call it preternatural. What Shirley Jackson called it, you know, when she wrote the haunting of Hill house, uh, which is, you know, it's stuff we don't understand yet. Someday we probably will. You know, I mean, the, the, the preternatural one, you know, the supernatural one generation becomes the natural of the next, Exactly. you know, it's, you know like, you know, not even that long ago, people were like, Hey, look, ma, South, you know, South America kind of fits with Africa. If you push them together, Oh, that's nice, Jimmy. You know, that's, that's crazy. But now we understand plate tectonics and, Oh, that they did fit together at one point, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and we're, and that's what I think some of these things are. These are the things like that, that, you know, chiropractic medicine is the one I always bring up to this day. A lot of medical schools say it's hocus pocus. It's, it's voodoo. You know, it's not really helping people. Cracking bones does not cure diphtheria, but people, you know, get relief from it and people actually get help from it. So is it completely bogus? No, it, we're, we just don't understand it yet. We need to study it more. It definitely and it's makes starting me feel to get better. into medical schools. So I think this is the same type of stuff. This is a science that we just don't understand yet. I mean, Tesla, Edison, these guys, you know, when they were, you know, and um, even, um, you know, uh, Alexander Graham Bell, when he invented the telephone, there were voices on the line. He was the only guy who had a phone and he's hearing voices. <laughs> You know, what, what are these voices? So he thought it was the dead and he was trying to invent a phone that could let you talk to the dead and, you know, but then he died and, you know, Edison, Tesla, they were convinced that, you know, the radio waves and stuff were picking up strange things. So, but again, these guys died before they could, or did they, you know, that's, that's the conspiracy theory is that that stuff's out there and we just can't use it. 
It's yeah. Oh gosh, we just did all kinds of episodes about that today with uh, mm. the government. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we don't trust them. I mean, I don't trust anybody yeah. as far as I can throw them. Specifically, the government. Well, I, I the the one that got me on it, you know, was uh, we were in Mayaka State Park. I was with the uh, great Stacy Brown of Finding Bigfoot fame, uh, and um, and we were out there. And we were there for an event that was going to be in a couple days, and we were just pre-marching the area where he was going to be doing his tour. And uh, somebody said, oh, we saw these weird footprints out by the river. And we're like, oh, let's let's go see. So we go way out to the Mayaka River, and um, there were, like, a, it looked like a family had been there, a family of skunk apes or Sasquatch. And because they were, like, little ones, big ones. Definitely not bear tracks. They were very unique, and they were right in the muddy riverbed. So we're like, these are perfect. Let's get out here, and we'll cast them. We'll come back tomorrow. Well, suddenly the government did a controlled burn in that area that was not scheduled. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I don't know. It was weird. But We, we literally, last night, was on a, we're doing something with a completely different podcast, and that same thing happened. Yeah. Where it yeah. was uh, looked like a nest site. Uh, like an Ohio uh, classic Ohio grassman nest, and it was uh, mm. it was all plowed up. It was it was it was kind of marshland, and it was all plowed yeah. up that week. And they oh, wow. they've never touched it. Uh, they've never touched oh, yeah. it in years. Uh, yeah. So it there somebody knows something. We talk about that yeah. all the time. Somebody knows something. Uh, yeah, but you have some amazing stuff, and I'm kind of chomping at the bit because there's one that. Since I started here on you know, like into the fray and stuff like that, there's one that always really gets me because it's just it's very unique, but it always it just captured okay. my imagination. So I'm I pretty to, sure I know which one. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I know what you're talking about. We talked a little bit about before the show, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, this is one. Um, it's kind of funny because this I love. I don't write stories when only one person has seen it one time. I just yeah. refuse. It's it's like it just goes into a file. Maybe somebody will corroborate it later, and then I can be like, oh, okay, now I can dig into it. That's why I'm like, if you see something, say something. So one of my friends, uh, great professor Sally Gage, uh, she's a uh, dog man uh, specialist. And she is a, uh, she actually has a degree in lycanthropology where she studied <laughs> werewolves in college. Uh, you know, um, but uh, she's amazing. And, um, and she's also one of my uh, Native American go-tos for lore because she's a uh, Mikasuki. So, uh, Ojibwa, Ojibwa, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, Sally. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so whenever I have a, you know, a question, she's one of my go-tos. Uh, but anyway, she was on a trip up North and, uh, going through the Florida, uh, coastline and she was going up by Jacksonville and she saw something strange and she called me. He's like, I got to tell Muncie. So she calls me and says, Mark, I just saw the weirdest thing as I was on the interstate and I was like, what's that? She said, it looked like um, a giant horse made out of vines and it came at my car at 80 miles an hour on the interstate and it kept up with me. You know, and then, and we could not believe it. My partner and I, you know, were freaking out and we tried to get, pictures but by then it had run back into the bushes and you know and that was it you know so um and that was you know i was like wow that's definitely interesting never heard of that and i you know and i filed it away in the in the file and i was like well you know something to think about that's kind of a cool story and she she just said it was you know she even said it was ghostly you know spectral you know it didn't have legs it just kind of floated above the ground at her car uh, or it may have just been moving so fast she didn't see the legs. And uh, she was driving, so, you know, couldn't exactly just, you know, right. take her eye off the road. Um, anyway, filed it away. And then, of course, like I said, I'm on a lot of radio shows, TV shows, podcasts, and I have a big following with truck drivers. So I get an email a couple weeks later from a truck driver who was in that same general area, maybe about 20 miles away. And he describes the exact same thing, only it did have legs, and it was like a horse made out of vines, and it was at least eight or nine feet tall because it had to be as big as the bonnet of his, uh, you know, of his uh, semi, and it charged at him, and he almost swerved to avoid it, 
when it literally just right at the last second swerved off and ran back into the bushes. So now I've got two completely independent people. I hadn't published it, hadn't talked about it, hadn't said a thing about it. And um, I'm like, wow. So I now my immediate thought is maybe there's a horse out there stuck in some kudzu. You know, uh, or maybe there's you know, an, you know, an animal in trouble and distress. So I didn't know how to reach out. You know, it's not exactly like, hey, does anybody know how to hunt, you know, spirit animals? You know, there's not those teams out there. So I reached out to a couple of Bigfoot hunting teams and a couple of dogman hunting teams in that area and said, hey, is anybody free? And of course, one of them was, and they went out there and looked and they did not find any signs of a distressed animal or anything like that. I did not tell them exactly what they were looking for. I just told them it was like a horse that, you know, you know might have had some vines wrapped around it and, uh, um, and they didn't find anything. But I then went on Shannon's show and talked about it. I went on a couple other shows and talked about it. And um, I got an email from a third witness who had seen something very similar. And then with that, I was able to figure out what forest it's basically out of. And we were able to narrow down the uh, exact mile marker and the exact location area. So there's basically a three exit area uh, right along the Florida Georgia border where this thing hangs out and um, and uh, and we've been looking into it and then I found some native lore from the area that I did not expect about a spirit animal that uh, basically from you know that that is in that area that is a shape changing beast that shakes takes the shape of a horse and takes the shape of plants and takes the shape of you know dogs and other creatures so it's 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 like a a skinwalker but not you know this one isn't evil this was more of a you know a protector spirit a guardian spirit of the woods and of course that area is having a lot of woods being chopped up and a lot of area is being re you know constructed because they're building what we think we we, we still haven't narrowed it down 100% but it looks like that's going to be an Amazon facility mm. in that area. And it's huge. And it's right along the rail lines and they're totally tearing it apart. Now that third witness was a train conductor who was on that rail line and he watched it and it chased his train hmm. for a little bit. So definitely crazy. It, it's amazing. And it just, when I first heard you t- tell it to have that we've kind of been known over here now for the organic UFO stuff, the sky creatures, uh, yeah. the, the famous one is one of our first ones we did was the Ohio River Manta Ray. So both oh, yeah. of those stories were turned in independently within 12 hours of each other before either of them were published. Two different nice. counties along the Ohio. And that's kind of what I just love that stuff yeah. where it's this yeah. it's that we you know, it's it's that confidence in some they are seeing something weird and it's not just a copycat thing because that happen you know, it happens in our field. It's Oh yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. It happens. And, you know, and that's, you know, I'll get that too. It's, you know, and those are pretty easy to spot. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, Oh yeah, I saw that in, you know, in, you know, 76 and, and it was, you know, and it was, you know, the, you know, and it's totally, they've just read the, some the same Wikipedia article that I've, I've heard repeated a hundred mm-hmm. times. And I'm like, you can't armchair this guys, you know, that's, it just, it just doesn't work. So, you know, and that's, and that's why I won't write about any place I haven't actually been I won't write about any place we, you know, that you can't go to. Uh, a lot of these books on haunted, yo, yo, X and X, you know, haunted Ohio. There's a, there's, there's a, there's a few books out there. Some are really good, but then there's a, a lot of them are, you know, people just listing all these buildings and half of them aren't there anymore. Yeah. Half of them are private property, and you will be shot if you go on them, you know. And and so that's why we don't put those in our books and stuff like that. So. Um, and, you know, but then you got to verify them. You got to, you got to have multiple witnesses. It's just, if one person says the place is haunted, it doesn't mean it's haunted. If 10 people say it's haunted where there's smoke, there might be some fire, yeah. but then you still want to verify it and all that. So that's awesome. Yeah. The Kudzu Kelpie is definitely one. It's just, yes. I love the name. My mind. That was the name we came up with. We were trying to get Shannon and I were actually trying to figure out what we're going to call this thing. Cause it's our cryptid. Now we, 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 we found it. We've got to name it. So, and, um, and I just, uh, while Carrie was drawing it because she was drawing it from the descriptions and uh, we still haven't premiered that illustration except on 
the you know, the early sketch on Shannon's thing. But that'll be in our next book, Erie Southeast, because we're finally doing the full write up on the kudzu kelpie. So this is very unprofessionally, but I'm actually going to stand up during this interview because I have something to show you. Oh, okay. So I can't hear you what for you just got? a second. Oh my gosh! For those of you at home, this is amazing. One second, I'm coming <laughs> back. Everybody knows I'm I'm quite the professional. That's all good. Look at that. Yes. So, uh, oh. I don't know if you know who Shatan is. Uh, she's in the, like out of Michigan, but she makes kelpies. Okay. Yeah. And I seen this one that was all leafy, and I'm like, I immediately like, that's the cut, like that's a kudzu yeah. kelpie. Kudzu kelpie. That's fantastic. And anybody that's seen me at conferences, I I bring all of the random stuffed animals. I didn't have it at Crypticon. Oh yeah, I would have. We would have loved that. So we would. Oh, yeah. I probably gave it to you at Crypticon. Ah, oh, no, no, no. But we I can have, always get we'll, more. We'll definitely have to reach out to her and uh, see if we can grab one. So, oh, yeah. That's pretty epic. But, yeah, no, I had to I had to show that to you because it just says that's, somebody, what, somebody that's why I bought it. Somebody at Crypticon brought us, speaking of, you know, Pinky, somebody brought us a Lapras that they had 3D printed, but they 3D printed it pink. Oh, so, my gosh. That's awesome. Yeah. So that was that was pretty cool. So people just bring us alcohol. That works, too. We're not. Uh, I'm. For drinking. I'm an epileptic, so I can't drink, but people you know, always try to bring me stuff like that or try to, hey, come out for a drink with me. I'm like, I'll have a tea. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Epileptic. I, I had a friend in uh, church that was epileptic, uh, epileptic yep. if I could speak. No. Yep. So what's some other eerie Florida guys we got? Oh, I mean, the, you know, again, like I said, Florida loves to rename everything when it comes down here. <laughs> So, you know, my, my favorite is we have this one Sasquatch that's uh, a little south of the area we were just talking about, like south of Jacksonville. And uh, this one goes way back in the 1800s in the town of Barden. And, um, and, this, and it's this, you know, this giant eight, ten foot tall creature. And it has a lantern mm-hmm. that appears before it does like a spectral lantern. And then it scared a lady off her horse. And it did all this other crazy things, and then it would disappear into the woods, and it would do what we would now call cloaking. Yeah. But back then, they just said it just faded into the woods, and it, you know. But then you could still see the light a little ways later. And now we're starting, you know, more, more modern stuff. We're starting to realize, hey, sometimes people talk about seeing Bigfoot with strange lights and weird flashes and stuff like that. But you know, do they call him the Beast of Barden? No. Do they call him the Barden Monster? No, no. We call him the Barden Booger. The and um, and, uh, and in the, the 1930s, 1940s, the Jacksonville newspaper starts writing editorials as the Barden Booger, uh, talking about how times have changed and you know how things are bad. And so that brings him back into consciousness. So then in the 60s, he actually gets a song, the Barden Booger Boogie. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and you can find that on YouTube. Um <laughs> And the couple that made that song used to do birthday parties in a Barton Booger outfit. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, and, and then all this was this one guy named Bud who ran a grocery store in town. Now, this is literally a one stoplight town, uh, Barton. Uh, he was like X Files Central for the Barton Booger. He had all the files and everything. Uh, but of course, he admitted that in the 70s, right after In Search of, when it had another surge that uh, the sheriff told him, hey, bud, stop whatever you're doing and because somebody's going to get hurt. And he's like, okay, because he had a friend out in the woods dressed in a costume oh, trying gosh. to drum up business. But, you know, and it was the 70s, somebody's going to get shot. Somebody's going to uh, get shot. But thankfully, you know, that was just then, but that didn't explain the hundreds of years of sightings. So, you know, so yeah, there was some hoax muddying the water there. But um, my, uh, I think my favorite story in Florida is one that we think actually did exist. We we think we have proven it, you know, within a you know with you know with a reasonable doubt. I think, um, 1937 in Punta Gorda, which you know gets hammered by a lot of storms, and this was the 1937 the Florida Alabama hurricane back before we named them, um, and it because it went from Florida Alabama. There were several that did that, but this one was that's what this one was called. Uh, but this one flew right past Punta Gorda and Port Charlotte Harbor. Uh, and, um, and it sucked all the water out of the bay. Like it does, like we saw Irma do in Tampa and we saw, you know, Ian just do that there as well. Um, you know, before it turned and head right in. So, um, 
So what happened was, is this was, you know, 1930s and just out of the Great Depression, families are starving and all the seafood is just literally laying out there. So people start running out, grabbing crabs, grabbing oysters, grabbing whatever they can. And this family, though, sees way out there, they think a pirate chest. So they're like, oh, this could be treasure. This could save our family. So they rush out there and they're trying to break into the chest. The water is coming back quickly, as it does. Um, and they finally break open the chest and it's filled with cannonballs. <laughs> cool thing, but you know, definitely not going to save your family in the depression. And they are now stranded. So they're running to try to beat this, the water that's coming back faster than they can run. Got a couple little kids. Uh, and they see this upside down, you know, this mound that, you know, that they're like, oh, let's climb up that. It's a little bit higher ground. Maybe we can figure out how far it is back to shore. Uh, they get over there and it starts rising and floating. And they're thinking, oh, my God, this is an upside down boat. And, you know, we're going to get washed out to sea still. This is terrible. Um, but then it turns and starts swimming against the current. And the girl, the little girl looks down and sees a head and sees fins. And it's a giant turtle. And, you know, 30 foot in diameter. And it saves this family. And, of course, it's exaggerated in stories. It's 60 foot. It's At Kroger, we want our fresh produce to meet your expectations, which is why we're dedicated to doing up to a 27-point inspection on our fruits and veggies, checking for things like scarring. In fact, only the best produce, like zesty oranges and crisp carrots, reach our shelves. Because when it comes to fresh, our higher standards mean fresher produce. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Save big on your favorites with the buy five or more, save a dollar each sale. Simply buy five or more participating items and save a dollar each with your card. Kroger, fresh for everyone. 50 foot, whatever. It's, and it's a giant box turtle. Um, and of course, it just disappears into legend. It's, you know, what a, what a silly story. You know, a family of four riding on a turtle. Never happened. Well, 1962, a little bit later, it's now Port Charlotte Harbor is a naval base. And uh, they're ready for the Russians to come because... They're, they're coming. We know it. And one of the Navy divers is out there cleaning the harbor, and he sees a dark, giant dark shape. It's a sub. It's a sub. You know, you know, scramble, scramble. Puts the alert out, and more divers hit the water, and more boats go out. And what they describe is a giant 30-foot leatherback turtle. Um, if accurate, that is the largest turtle ever seen, ever. Yeah, I mean, they've caught leatherback turtles 17 foot, 18 foot in diameter. And something we've got like pictures that. of those. And they're huge. You could fit two or three people hanging onto one of them. You know, uh, you know, a 30 foot. We don't know how big they get in the wild. We, we really don't. We don't know how long they live. So this would have been just, you know, less than 30 years later. And, you know, it could have just gotten bigger and stayed in that area. And, and now we're even finding a new species of giant turtle out there just this year that, could you know that we don't know how big it's going to get? We think it's around twenty feet in diameter. Uh, the ones we've seen out there, and that's in the Gulf, same water. That's so, amazing. Yeah. I, so, the I, Punta Gorda turtle story, you know, maybe not a cryptid. You know, like I said, preternatural is becoming the natural. Rare animal, just a rare yep. animal. I mean, exactly. Have Have you ever heard the the missing shark story? It's in our intro. Uh, we did it as a Patreon episode. The eight foot uh, great white shark that got eaten. Yes. So yes. Do you and, the cool thing about that we t- covered it the the whatever animal ate it had a core body temperature of like I can't I remember the exact number it was like 82.1 it was right. the identical core body temperature of only one animal on the planet and that's the leatherback sea turtle just sea turtle yep the leatherback so sea turtle, turtle specifically yeah yeah a giant giant leatherback sea turtle could have eaten that shark yeah that's one of those that was another potential proof of uh you know, of the sea turtle there in That's Punta awesome. Gorda. That, that family wasn't crazy. You know, it, you know, it was, it could have easily happened. You know, you know, whether it gently swam the back to shore, you know, that's folklore. That's, you got to separate the truth from the fiction. Right. So, and then sadly that's, you know, that happens a lot where you separate the truth from the fiction and the truth is so much scarier than the folklore. Uh, probably the one that put us on the map in Erie, Florida was uh, mini lightning or mini lights. And uh, it was one I'd run in my haunted house for years. And uh, 
this is this is dark because uh, basically the story was that I heard was if you said many lights three times, these little green lights would chase you. As particularly if you were around this certain area of town uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida, and and I you know it was a weird story. I didn't think much of it, but then when we started doing Erie, Florida, I'm like, well, I'm digging into these legends. Let's dig into many lights. It's it's such a crazy story. And what I found out was on the south side of town, it was a much different story. It was it was many light digging. And she was the voodoo queen of St. Petersburg. And her gator boys will steal your children at night. I'm like, wow, that escalated quickly. <laughs> uh, you know, um, this is, uh, you know, this is crazy. You know, her gator boys. And then, you know, oh, yeah, they live in the sewers. It's alligators in the sewers, you know, all over. And, and she's the voodoo queen. And she hates Marie Laveau in New Orleans. So she steers all the hurricanes from us over to New Orleans. And it's like. Okay, I can kind of see that. And then uh, she also summons all the lightning. So we have the Tampa Bay Lightning. She's, you know, one of the many reasons we have lightning because there's a lot of folklore legends of why we are the lightning capital of the world. Um, and uh, anyway, so I'm looking into that and I try to figure out what the heck is this from? Because my initial angle was it's many, many lights. Sounds a lot like Mennonite. And there were several Mennonite mm -hmm. communities in the area. And uh, then over in Gibsonton, which is across Tampa Bay, there was the circus town. It's, you know, American Horror Story Freak Show was set in Gibsonton. It was the town where all the freaks went to live while they were wintering down here because Ringling was down in Sarasota. He wouldn't let them stay with him, but they could stay up here, and, and they would all try to get in with whatever circus was in the area. But anyway, there was a boarding house there run by a Mennonite that got burned down, and I'm like, aha! And she maybe had a guy's with gator skin or something. That's That's got to be it. You know, that's that's got to be their legend. Um, and sadly we had to, you know, a, a deadline. So we went to print with that. I'm like, this is it. I, I've got it. I figured out many lights. Then six months later, the publisher says, Hey, Erie, Florida's hit bestseller list. Let's, let's do a follow-up book. You know, you got more stories. Yeah. Just give me some time to research. Give me some time to do that. So I'm in the St. Petersburg museum of history. I'm researching for the next book. And I open this old book looking for photographs of this one lost tourist attraction. And something else literally fell in my lap, and it was the answer to many lights. Um, it was a fan that you would hold, cool yourself off while you're standing at an old tourist attraction. And this was a 1930s tourist attraction. It was the St. Petersburg Alligator Farm, which is like those alligator farms mm -hmm. down in Miami. Um, and this had been the 1930s. And on the front is two African-American children being chased by alligators. Mm. And it says gator bait. And what one of their attraction Ooh. was, was they would go and they would kidnap children from the neighborhoods of South Side of St. Petersburg, and then they would throw them in these alligator pits and let them be chased around for tourist entertainment. What? Yes. That just kept so, getting darker and darker and darker. So beware of mini lightning. You know, her gator boys will steal your children, or beware of mini lights. It was actually beware of the men with lights. The Gator Boys will steal your children. They would go out with lights after dark and look for kids and kidnap them. Oh my gosh! So that's that's scarier than any monster. Any we exactly. That's I don't. That's a whole nother level of stuff. And so now that blew up. We you know we got that in the press and and now the St. Pete Museum of History has that as one of their dark exhibits. You know just. Say, look, it wasn't all fun and games here, you know. So, that's some crackpot research there for you, because that's that's crazy. Like, to actually find the fan that depicted that, like, that's amazing. It literally fell in my lap, quite literally, out of the book into my lap. So, wow, I love it, and and it all just came together. It's just it's nuts. So, I love it. So, if I've done nothing else, I I brought that piece, you know, back to back to fruition there. So. I mean, that's a... And Florida loves to bulldoze their history. I mean, one of our site, you know, places in the first book here in Florida was the grave of Wicodemus, supposedly the grave of a demon uh, on Amelia Island and near Fernandina Beach. And now it's all been bulldozed and it's a housing project. So, Isn't all know, of Florida? It... Huh? Isn't all of Florida? Pretty much. I mean, that's, I, I still tell everybody what you do is when you look at Florida from space, like we're the space coast, right? We launch rockets every couple weeks now. Um I remember when I grew up, that was a rare thing. Now, now it's literally, there was one today. Uh, yeah, but, um, and uh, 
you know, but uh, you look at it from space. When they're launching up and they show those cameras back in Florida, especially the night launches, this is the best way to do it. You see the beaches are all lit up except for that little bit of the big bend, you know, the Apalachicola. They call that a forgotten coast because that's not where the tourists are. Uh, so, and it's also the beaches aren't, they're, they're swampy. It's not as much fun. Um, but all of those are lit up like a Christmas tree, right? You go a little further in and you see the big cities that support the beaches, the Jacksonvilles, the Miamis, the Fort Lauderdales, the Daytonas, the Tampas, the, you know, even the Fort Myers and all that. They, you know, they, they light up. And then, you know, even on the Panhandle, Pensacola, you know, Destin, all that. Um, and then you go a little further in and it's a little darker because it's all the suburbs, you know, there's the sprawl. And then that's getting wider. But then there's these big, dark spots with little pinpricks of light. And that's, you know, the Everglades, the Ocala National Forest, Mayaka State Forest, the Green Swamp. These are our natural areas and the dark areas that have not been penetrated by man in many areas you know um and it's and they're scary and that's where this stuff lives that's where we get so many bigfoot sightings out of mayaka and out of ocala it's crazy that's you know and the and the everglades dave shealy has got skunk cape headquarters down there people always talk about the patterson gimlin film and and all that you know some of the best bigfoot footage ever dave shealy has He's the unsung hero uh, down in uh, uh, Everglades City. He has the Skunk Ape headquarters, and people are like, oh, he's in it for the money. Well, he's got to make a living. Right. Uh, but this was before all that. He had a campground down there, and he filmed 2008, 10 minutes of a Skunk Ape running through a swamp. And it's the most incredible footage ever. And nobody talks about it because – it doesn't look like a Bigfoot. It looks like this orangutan looking thing. It's lanky, it's thin, but that's what our skunk apes down there are all reported as looking like. They're four toed and and this is running in deep swamp. I've been to that area. Dave took me out there. Nobody's in a costume out in that. And let alone gonna be filmed for minutes. Uh, and it's, you know, Dave just happened to be there that day at a hunting spot and saw it and filmed it. And, um, and I still think to this day he doesn't get the credit he deserves. He mm. should be on every show with that footage, and nobody wants to talk to him because it's crazy. It's Florida man, so we just ignore it. So, well, next time you see him, you tell him he's welcome to come on here. Okay, yeah, we'd love I'll to be have down him. Here. It's if you go down to the you know uh, Alligator Alley, the old original Alligator Alley, not seventy five right. now. Uh, you'll go right past Skunk Cave headquarters, and that's where his it's his campground still. But he also sells T shirts and other stuff, and uh, he's got the the cast from uh that and uh also there is he's got a little reptile exhibit and he has the world's second largest anaconda in captivity and i think she's actually the biggest now they haven't gotten guinness back there since 2010 and the other one died so okay, i can't yeah, imagine so... goldie has gotten any smaller no so and she only missed it by like a foot oh. so you know that's awesome. But uh, yeah, I actually had a coworker there like half a month ago or so. Oh, yeah. Uh, took pictures with the skunk ape out front. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's classic. They, they know I'm a Bigfoot. You know, they know they know who I am. Yeah. So they're just like, <laughs> they, they know you. <laughs> we, we were going, they were going to the Keys. They're like, but we had to oh, swing yeah. by and get a picture with the Bigfoot for you. Well, hopefully they went and saw Robert down in the Keys. Um, we have to. We if we're going to talk about Robert, we have to ask permission. Yes, so, uh, uh, I've never brought him up before because of well, the, the the things with him. So you go right ahead. Well, I'll go right ahead because I did the documentary on him for uh, Travel Channel last year and uh, Discovery Plus. Now, if you want to look it up, uh, we are going to talk about the most amazing person, you know, Florida's most infamous resident. But we out. He, he has rules, so we have to say nice things about him, uh, and that, of course, is Robert the Haunted Doll. Um, AKA Robert the doll. And um, he uh, was the childhood toy of Robert Eugene Otto. And uh, in the Key West in the early days, Key West was the richest city in America at this time. And his family had a lot of money. And the dad came home from Germany with this amazing toy, this uh, basically one of a kind. Uh, we now think there were six, uh, but they were made for a display. Uh, they were made by the Steiff company, the company that makes teddy bears a few years later and, and all this. So um, 
they are, you know, in, this incredible doll, and it becomes his toy. It becomes his favorite toy. And uh, but then as soon as he gets at home, weird stuff starts happening. Strange things occur. Toys, other toys start breaking. You know, stuff starts breaking around the house. And his mom goes up to him and says, you know, Robert, you got to stop doing this. And he goes, no, no, no. I'm going to go by my middle name from now on. I'm going to go by Gene. Uh, and the doll is going to take my name, Robert, because we don't want any confusion. And Robert did it. And, you know, nowadays we'd have given that kid some riddle and, and we wouldn't have a story. But, um, you know, thankfully we didn't. And, uh, and so the doll, you know, legend grew and grew. And then he moved away. Locked, they locked the doll in the attic. Uh, he grew up, had a wife, kid, still going by Gene. Uh, and, you know, and then when he comes back, when his mom's dying, he they find the doll. They move back in the old house, and they find the doll, and he's inseparable from the doll again, and you know, much to his wife's chagrin. Uh, and um, eventually he dies. She sells the house, but she says, you have to take this doll with you because this doll is, you know, creepy, and I don't want it. Uh, the new owners quickly, you know, fall in love with the doll, but then weird stuff starts happening to them. So they quickly bug out and demand the next people take the doll. The next owner keeps the house for a while, and she has problems with the doll. But when she sells the house, she actually took the doll with her for some strange reason, even though she was getting rid of it. Uh, and then finally, after years, she's like, I can't handle it anymore. She takes it to this museum uh, the Fort East Martello Museum, which is an old Civil War fort converted into an art museum. And she gives them the doll and says, this is Robert the Haunted Doll. I don't want anything to do with it. I hope you know what you're doing. Um, and they didn't know what to do with it for a while. They just kind of put it in their collection of artifacts. Um, and But Robert wanted to be seen. And he started showing up in places and doing crazy things. And so they finally made an exhibit for him. And that's where they figured out his rules. Because there were, as people were interacting with them, strange stuff would happen and they would come and have to apologize to it. And, um, and that's, so that's when you get the rules. So, you know, like all good gremlins and all these other things, you know, the Fey, you have the rules you have to follow with Robert is you always have to be polite. When you talk to Robert, you have to introduce yourself, you know, and you have to say nothing but nice things. That's you know, rule number two, only say nice things. Uh, you know, don't disrespect him. Rule number three is if you take his picture, always ask permission. Now they figured that one out because people would take pictures and their cameras would die or the pictures wouldn't come out and, you know, and all that, or, you know, the cell phones would suddenly crack, you know? Um, and then the last one is the important one. The fourth one is say goodbye. Part of being polite, you know, just say goodbye, break that connection. Cause if you don't, he follows you. Now, if you screwed up any of those rules, you have a get out of jail and that's when you have to send them a letter and say, Robert, I'm sorry, I screwed up, I didn't believe you, I, I disrespect you, I took your photo off permission, whatever. Uh, I forgot to say goodbye. You know, please, you know, remove your curse. And, you know, you think about this and you're like, this is crazy. Uh, but everything in the world has been blamed on this doll. People write them saying from lost luggage to, you know, food poisoning to, you know, uh, the, the wedding being ruined, the then to car crashes, plane say, crashes, yeah. lost lives, lost businesses, you know, lost, you know, everything. It's, it's terrifying. And he literally gets a hundred letters a week that of just people apologizing to him um, on average, a hundred letters a month, but there are weeks where he gets hundreds, especially after spring break. Oh yeah. I'm sure a all, lot all the college kids break. coming down. Yep. And they make, Oh, look at this stupid doll. Oh, you know, you got to write a letter. Yeah. Uh, Cause you know, suddenly you get home and you know, your, your house is on fire. You know, it's, it's crazy now. Um, so people come from all over the world to see Robert. And I know um, one of the TV shows, everybody thinks he's at a museum in Las Vegas now, but he is not, he is still in Key West. Uh, you know, much to the guy who runs the museum in Vegas would like to think, let everybody think he's there. He's not, he's, He's down in Key West, and you can go visit Robert anytime um, and, uh, you know, tell him Erie, Florida sent you. There you go. Well, Robert, thank you for letting us talk about you. Yes, uh, Robert. It was a pleasure. And, Robert, goodbye. Goodbye, Robert. So, uh, we'll see you soon. So, And if you want to know more about Robert, you can go to the Discovery Plus and look up Curse of Robert the Doll. That was my documentary last year. So, Everybody, please check that out. 
Uh, yeah, Robert's one I take very seriously. Oh yeah, no, uh, don't poke the bear. That's no. that's one of my rules. Is you know I don't poke the bear. So yeah, it's it's not worth it. Even if no. there's yeah, it's just not worth it. It's just you know it's so little to do to do stuff right. Yeah, and what was what was cool about that documentary is we got to make with they they made a stunt Robert. So that, you know, so he could actually move and do the things. And, you know, whenever you see somebody holding the Robert, it's not the real Robert. Right. Because real Robert is in the case. He's 100 years old. Nobody touches him. Uh, you know, except for hurricanes, he has bug out points. I'm one of his emergency bug out points in case the storms come. Uh, uh, but that's how rare, you know, he, he moves. But uh, so the stunt Robert was made by the Jim Henson Company. Oh, wow. And we'd all sign these NDAs. We weren't allowed to talk about it, you know, until it aired. And I was chomping at the bit because... But one of the things was, is right after we started filming with Stunt Robert, we introduced Stunt Robert to real Robert. And I'm like, and then they started filming with Stunt Robert. And I'm like, wait, 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 guys. You got to ask Stunt Robert's permission to film and do all this now. And I'm like, what? What? And I'm like, we don't want to poke the bear. This mm-hmm. is just you know, basic security. You know, you've made an effigy of an effigy. You know, it, you know, the image of Robert could be the image of Robert. So, um, so, you know, it's funny now because that's actually now in the Jim Henson collection. Oh, wow. Uh, it, you know, so so Robert the Doll is in the Jim Henson Museum. The, you know, the, the, the stunt Robert. So Amazing. Is there, now am I wrong, but is there the island of dolls too in Florida? That is actually off the coast uh, of uh, kind of Louisiana. Okay. But, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's up near the Panhandle. So it's, you know. Less than an hour from Florida, but okay. you know, Florida is eight hours from Florida. So, you know, depending on which part you're going to. I literally we said that time we, zones. we were recording yeah. that today. When you get to Florida, when you get to the Florida border, you're still eight hours from Florida. Yes, exactly. Like, so it d- depends on what you want. Like if you're going to see the two egg stump jumper, which is like a, our, our puck wedgie, that's oh, that's wow. maybe an hour from the border. Yeah. Uh, if you're if you're looking for, you know, the, the Brooks Bridge ghost wolves. That's up in the Panhandle, so that's not too far, you know, if you're coming from Alabama. But if you're going, you know, the theme parks, you know, down in the heart, that bright heart, again, remember, you see it from space, there's that big bright heart, that's where all the theme parks are. That's where most people think of Florida, is the beaches or that big dark, or that big bright spot. It's all those dark spots that, that's four hours of nothing, all of them. Oh, yeah. So, The wolves are another really, really cool one I heard you talk about before. Yeah, that's a crazy story. It was one we thought we were the only people who knew. Uh, because when we got up there, it's this bridge that goes from Fort Walton Beach, uh, from Destin to Fort Walton Beach, and it's called the Brooks Bridge. And at one point it was a land bridge, but now it's, you know, they've made it a canal so boats can get through and they put a bridge over it. Well, there was a, there's legends of a, a pack of wolves that are spectral, and, you know, ghostly, that run across the, the old land bridge. And people stay end up on that bridge and see them and are haunted by them for years. It affects their brains. They have dreams about seeing these ghostly wolves running across the water. And uh, it's another one of those fun ones with rules. It's like it happens on every full moon or it happens the third Thursday of every month. It's all these weird versions of it. So how are you going to legend trip that, right? So we went up and stayed a week. To see, you know, between a third Thursday and a full moon, we were like, we've, we've got the perfect week to go look for this. Um, and we got out there, and it's late at night. It's a beach town. Basically closes at 10 o'clock, except for the bars. And we're sitting there out on this bridge, and then there's tons of people still standing out on this bridge. And I'm like, is there an event tonight? Or there's, is there going to be fireworks? Did we pick a bad night? You know? And I started asking people, what are you here for? And they're like, oh, we're here for the wolves. What? And they're like, yeah, you know, my dad saw him when he was a kid, and we, you know, hopefully they're here this time. And then their guy, oh, I saw him, you know, last month, and I'm dying to see him again, and I'm trying to get him on camera. And you know, and then another guy is like, oh yeah, I saw him when I was a kid, and I'm, you know, I'm back here again. It was, I was like, my mind was blown that so many people knew this legend, and uh, you know, and were trying to see it again, and new witnesses who had seen it, you know, that I did not know about. So I got all these great stories, and Carrie got to sketch out how many wolves exactly there were, and how big the pack was and what that alpha looked like, you know, and all that. So it was very cool. And, uh, yeah, it's one of those, I, we didn't get to see them that night. They did not show up for us, but you know, that that's just how it goes. Not every night's Halloween. Right. You don't get that lucky every time yeah. you go out. Sometimes you do. Yeah. Not every time. So have you had any, 
personal experiences with anything? I've I'm... had a few over the years. Uh, what started all for me was my family monster. Our uh, our our lead holler monster was. Uh, it's one of those. Again, even though Florida can't have nice things, most anywhere can't have nice things because we got to name them stupid stuff. Uh, this is a creature that's on my family land on the Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia border. You said you're Ohio boy. Yep. I'm Ohio too. I was the first in my family born above the Mason Dixon line. So, you know, I'm the Yankee kid. Um, but we, every weekend we would go to our farm in Louisa, Kentucky and, uh, which is right on the Georgia West Virginia border. And, um, there was a monster there on the land that my father and my uncle would tell us about. And it had the head the, the dis, deformed head of a man that uh, kind of glowed. It had the body of a cow or a cat, a big cat. And then it had uh, a wooden leg that it would jump from tree to tree and knock you off your horse with the wooden leg um, if you were a bad person. So, um, and what was this creature called? The bench leg. <laughs> dumbest name ever right it sounds like something out of south park right uh you know scuzzle bud or something mm -hmm. you know so this is the bench leg of Goble ridge and you know growing up here in that story, i didn't want to hear that i wanted to hear ghost stories i'm like this is the dumbest thing ever this isn't uh but there was a legend that it was a guy who had been murdered and you know and and somehow had come back as this spirit creature uh that you know wreaked vengeance well I didn't think much of it as a kid. I was out there looking for stars. It was dark sky territory. So I'd go out there looking for stars. And this is, of course, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, you know, Star Wars was my life, Close Encounters, you know, in search of. I'm looking for aliens. I'm looking for all that. I didn't care about that stupid monster. Um, and, then, um, and then one night I'm in the field. I'm out looking at the stars. And it's supposed to be a meteor shower that night. And... Um, one of the horses in the land comes by me and it just goes running, you know, clips past me. And I'm like, Oh, some stirred him up. And then the second horse comes running by a few moments later. And I'm like, wow, they're, they're stirred up something fierce. And then I hear more like almost sound like galloping. And I'm like, what is coming up? And I'm thinking, Oh God, is it a bear? Is it, you know, and I'm like, what do I have? I have a BB gun and a flashlight. This is, this is not good. You know, and, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm poops, poops. maybe I'll get lucky. No, no, this is terrible. Um, and then this thing comes running by and it's dark shaped and it looked like a big cat and it had some strange glow around its head and it looked back at me and it looked just monstrous. It looked like this deformed head thing and it ran off into the woods. I don't know what I saw. And that's, that was what started it all for me was, wow. you know, and as, you know, as we're doing research later on, I found out there was a peddler who was killed in that area, you know, in that area in the, you know, early 1800s. And uh, he was jumped by a band of bandits. They murdered him and to hide the body, they killed his ox and buried that on top of him. And apparently he had fought back with a stick and, you know, does that make a spirit of vengeance like that? I guess it does. So, and now I have a story to add to, you know, and I realized every member of my family in that area had some story that involved that creature. And it, none of them made sense. It wasn't scary. I wasn't scared. I didn't know what the heck it was, you know, and, and that, so that's what, you know, stirred me to, you know, write these things is, you know, I got to keep doing that. Now, since then, I've, you know, see, we've had some strange encounters we've had you know some ghostly activity uh most recently last october at the, the may stringer house here i was with a couple of youtube vloggers uh that do travel vlogs uh, tampa j and chris the girl uh and if you look up there tampa j chris the girl ghost they'll show this video we were in the may stringer house because they were doing a haunted house in their haunted house for charity and they gave us a sneak preview and because i'm friends with the museum after the sneak preview was over we got to go look at the areas that weren't turned into the haunted house. And we got to go up into the attic where there's a famous ghost there called Mr. Nasty. And, uh, and we were up there in the attic alone for a little bit. And we were just talking about him. And suddenly the door behind me flies open. And this is an attic in Florida in a sealed building. Their windows don't open. There is no air up there. We were sweating to death because it's October and Florida is 90 degrees. 
so there's no air conditioning. Why did that door blow open? It was the ghost literally showing us the door, get out. <laughs> and uh, and you, you could hear the two YouTubers, um, and uh, I and you see my face. I'm like, yep, time to go. It's I guess that's leave. it. Yeah, bye. Yeah. Again, don't poke the bear. That's our time. That's our cue. Yeah. So that's amazing. We're at the hour mark right now. Oh man, that All flew right. by. Time flies. So I want to take a little bit. I want you to re-give all your, all your books, all your plugs, all that stuff again. Uh, once again, everybody at home, all the links will be down in the description below. Uh, down in the description below. If I could talk, I've been recording all day, so my words just kind of melt. Uh, uh, but yeah, and I'll have all, I'll have everything below. Uh, please get a okay. hold of Mark if you have any yeah, kind please. of story like this stuff. Anything, get a hold of Mark. Love to hear it. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, you can find me. Just about anywhere. I'm not hard to find. Uh, I am uh, Erie, Erie, Florida is the best first book. Uh, that was 2015. 2017 was Freaky Florida, the follow up. 2019 was the follow up to that, which is Creepy Florida, which is nothing but paranormal. Although we still snuck in some cryptids. That's where we put in the Brooks Bridge and, uh, you know, the Ochizy Pond wild man ghost, a ghost of a skunk ape. Uh, so we snuck some in that were fun. Uh, and then uh, the new book, Erie Appalachia, came out 2022. And um, and then the next book should be out this fall called uh, Erie Southeast, which was basically the stories that were for Appalachia but weren't in the mountains. So they were, you know, low country awesome. stories. And that'll be coming this fall. And you can find all those wherever fine books are sold. Uh, they're from the History Press. You can get it direct from their website. Or you can order it direct from our website, which is erieflorida.com or erietravels.com. And those link direct to us, and you can order from us. And my lovely wife, Carrie, will draw a little something in it, and I'll write some words of wisdom. Or you can find us at whatever cons we're going to be at. We've got our, let's say we'll be at Mad Monster uh, in February, and then Pensacon in February, and you know, and future ones beyond that. Um, hopefully back at Mothman Festival, we were there this year, and hopefully back at CryptidCon awesome. uh, yeah, in the fall. So um, we love, we now that we're out of Florida, we can do anywhere. So um but uh, yeah, and then you can find my show Erie Travels on YouTube. Uh, it's a local show down in Tampa Bay for a local television station, but they they've started putting them up on YouTube. So awesome stuff. So we end it here with a tradition. Every time we have a guest on, basically I'm going to count down from three, and at the end of that countdown, we're both going to scream by, and then the outro will play. That sounds good. All right, three, two, one, bye. 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 Thank you for listening to Crips of the Corn podcast. Please share with a friend you think would like us. It's the best way to help our show grow. Leave a comment, rate us, a five-star review. And remember, there is always extra content on Patreon slash Crips of the Corn dot com. And don't forget, stay magical. Science proves quality sleep is vital to your mental, emotional, and physical health. The Sleep Number 360 Smart Bed senses your movements and automatically adjusts to help keep you both effortlessly comfortable. And it's temperature balancing, so you stay cool. So you're at your best for yourself and those you care about most. Life-changing sleep, only from Sleep Number. It's our ultimate Sleep Number event. Save 50% on the Sleep Number 360 Limited Edition Smart Bed, plus special financing ends Monday. To learn more, go to sleepnumber.com. Special financing subject to credit approval. Minimum monthly payments required. See store for details.